Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a uh, very warm welcome to our uh, episode nine of our Transforming the Future of Land Management webinar series. My name is Matthew Morris. I'm a land steward with the Duchy of Cornwall, and I'm joined today, as usual, by Tim Hopkin, who is the founder of Land App. Today, we're going to be hearing from Jeremy Moody from the Central Association of Agricultural Valuers, and also from Harry Greenfield from the Country Landowners Association. The theme today is on where our speakers see opportunities and new areas of work for the land management sector. It can at times be too easy to look inwards at opportunity and focus on your own patch, whether it be a field, a farm or an estate. There is, however, a much wider global impetus to build back better. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, spoke yesterday at the launch of the Great Reset of the World Economic Forum. He said there is a golden opportunity to see something good from this crisis. Global crises know no borders and highlight how interdependent we are as one people sharing one planet. He urges progress. Unless we take the action necessary and we build again in a greener and more sustainable and more inclusive way, then we will end up having more and more disasters from ever accelerating global warming and climate change. In January, the Prince launched the Sustainable Markets Council at the World Economic Forum in Davos, an initiative aimed at showing that economic growth and protecting the environment can go hand in hand. The Prince believes passionately that a green recovery should be at the centre of global efforts to rebuild economies and could be integral for getting people back to work in the post-pandemic world. Nature is the true engine of our economy. And we, Tim and I, we see through the fabulous knowledge base that's here in the industry that the UK can be a leading light in demonstrating that land management can not only play its part, but also can lead the way in ensuring that that green recovery happens. What an opportunity for the whole sector. It's very exciting. First, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, your camera and microphone will remain off throughout this session today. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see our Q&A button. Uh, you can click on this to ask questions of our speakers, that's the Q&A button, and on there you can vote up popular questions, which just gives me a steer as to which ones to ask. You'll also see a chat button, uh, please only use this if you've got technical queries, and Tim will be your uh, host on the chat function. Uh, as ever, we use Slido, um, which is our sort of interactive poll, and don't forget that using a smartphone is the easiest way to access Slido. You just turn your camera on and point it at your screen. It's, it's really easy. Um, our website has got all of our Slido results, which is really interesting. You'll see some really interesting themes developing there. So it's well worth taking a look at that. Uh, it's enough from me. I'll hand over to Tim, who's going to give us an overview of today and talk us through our speakers, guide us through the technical bits. And a bit later on, Tim's also going to update you on the development of our rural collaborative brain that we talked about last week. Uh, Tim will give us a bit of an update on that. So you will see me again at the Q&A at the end. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. And, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Matthew said, my name is uh, Tim Hopkin, and I'm the founder of the Land App, which, as you all know, is an easy to use and free digital mapping application for the rural land management sector, not only for day-to-day -day management tasks, but also for preparing for ELMS. Um, so yes, yeah, today we have a couple of wonderful, wonderful speakers. We have Harry Greenfield from the Country Landowners Association, who's going to be presenting on opportunities for the land management sector. And we have Jeremy Moody from the CAAV, um, who's going to be presenting on tomorrow's work, Perspective on the Future of Land Management. Now, as I'm sure you're all uh, very well aware of, we start these um, uh, webinars with a quick question to you. Um, so today is no different. Uh, we have a question today which is inspired by Prince Charles's presentation. And I'm just going to share this down to all of you through the chat function. Uh, so let me just quickly send this through. So this is one option um, where you can just uh, uh, hit the escape button on your keyboard, um, open the chat function and grab the link. And then you can open it up in a browser and start answering. Um, or alternatively, as Matthew just said, you can take out your smartphone, um, turn on the camera, 
focus it on this QR code in the top left, and that should allow you to answer the question on your smartphone. So the question we have for you today is, what can the UK land management sector be doing to lead the green recovery in a post-pandemic world? So enter countryside stewardship, more trees. So yeah, so what can the UK do? How can the UK uh, land management sector lead the green recovery in a post-pandemic world? What can we do? What can we all be doing together? How can we take this as an opportunity that allows us as a sector to drive forward and create uh, new opportunities um, for, for the whole of the economy. So take stock, promote agroecology, natural capital at its center, opportunity mapping, trees, collaboration, natural capital. Okay, here we go, education. Um, this become, has been a consistent theme throughout everything we've done over the last nine weeks. Um, so collaboration, natural capital. So. What can the UK land management sector be doing to lead the green recovery in a post-pandemic world? So, so maybe this is how can we all become educated? How can we work collaboratively to grow an educational platform for the whole of the sector? How can we all get on the same page? How can we communicate? How can we share ideas? So collaboration, education, natural capital, regenerative agriculture as a way of leading, agroecology, very, very similar, soil management all combined. So maybe it's about new farming practices as a way of uh, leading the uh, the green recovery in a post-pandemic uh, world. So we'll just uh, give it a, a 30 seconds more or so. Uh, for those who've answered, you can actually answer multiple times. So do feel free to throw in all your ideas. Um, gr brilliant. So regenerative agro education, collaboration, agroecology, soil management. Great. Any more thoughts? Do add them in. Brilliant. And as you all know, we really respond to a lot of this. So, um, so please, you know, do become part of the conversation and help us sort of grow the next phase of land management 2.0. Brilliant. We're going to stop it there. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand over to our first uh, presenter, who is Harry Greenfield, uh, who is um, from the Country Land and Business, Business Association, um, who's presenting uh, opportunities for the land management sector. Harry, I'll let you start sharing your screen, unmute yourself, and uh, start your presentation. Great, Harry, we can see your screen now. Can you hear me as well? There we are. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Over to you, Harry. Thanks a lot, Tim, and uh, very happy to be presenting here. I've been enjoying the webinar series, so it's a great opportunity to come and talk a bit about what the CLA is doing in this area, which is uh, quite a lot, I hope. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the context and drivers for some of the changes in land management that we're seeing, a bit about how the CLA works and what we're doing to help our members uh, face the future, um, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about um, some specific policy changes that are coming and other changes as well, and what they could mean, um, and end with a couple of thoughts about um, how we can sort of face the future together as a sector. So to start with, uh, what is the CLA? Um, it is the Country Land and Business Association, as we're now known. So we represent around 30,000 farmers, landowners, and rural businesses in England and Wales. It's a very varied membership. So we have the traditional estates, which may be the sort of stereotypical view of um, what a CLA member is like, but we also have um, smaller farms. Uh, I think the majority of our membership own uh, under 500 acres and many much smaller than that. And a lot of different types of rural business as well. So I think if there's any uh, land-based or rural business, something in the countryside, chances are that there's a CLA member somewhere who is doing it. Um, so it's a very diverse membership. And what we offer to our members, we have uh, advice from experts in a range of fields, so tax, uh, legal, business, or land use advice uh, free to our members. And I think the other big part of it is influencing decision makers. So we use insights gained from our members' experiences about practical land management on the ground and how policy is implemented. And we use this to feed up to government and others to make sure that uh, future policy is designed in a way that, that works uh, for land managers. And it's also the CLA is a, is a great place for networking, an opportunity to, to learn, to visit each other's businesses or farms, see what other people are doing, share, share what works and what doesn't, uh, and generally sort of present a, a united uh, face towards people. 
Um, so I probably don't need to tell people listening that change is coming. Um, I think Brexit is obviously one of the key drivers for a changing policy landscape that's going to affect land management. So we have the Agriculture Bill and the Environment Bill currently making their way uh, slightly slowly given political uh, developments over the past couple of years, but they're making their way through Parliament. And from then stem a whole raft of policies which either directly or indirectly will affect land management in the future. I think there's also there's a wider issue around public um, interest in or, or uh, concern for the environment and particularly climate change has risen up the agenda recently. So as well as the backdrop of Brexit, there's also the climate emergency, the government's commitment to net zero, which is having a big impact. Um, so I think that inevitably change on this scale does bring risks with it. Um, so I think that one of the things I find interesting is that I feel like we were just starting to understand more about how to value land management in a sort of different way, perhaps to traditionally to know about the social and environmental benefits of well-managed land. Uh, you could call them byproducts, but often they're not. Um, but there's a lot of work still to be done on this. And yet, because of the sort of radical nature of, of Brexit and of uh, the policy change, the removal of direct payments and a new trading relationship, I think we probably now need to move a lot quicker perhaps down this path thinking around things like natural capital, social capital, um, than would otherwise perhaps have been the case. I think there's also a lot of thinking to be done around uh, how to make commercial land management profitable in its own right, so I'll talk a bit about that later. And something the CLA has been focused on a lot is around the transition. So we've heard from the government, at least, where they want us to end up um, with post precedent uh, agriculture and land use policy. Um, but to get from where we are now to there, there's a lot of moving parts. So there's, um, you know, there's removal of direct payments, introduction of the new environmental land management scheme, along with what happens to existing agri-environment schemes and productivity investments. So, there's a lot to, to take place, and I think the CLA's concern has always been that sort of administrative mismanagement of that process could mean that uh, financially viable businesses could come under an extreme economic pressure because of a sort of misalignment of when the old policies are taken away and the new policies are introduced. So we're, we're very concerned that the government needs to, to get that transition right. So to talk in a bit more detail about three areas in particular, um, first thing I'm going to talk a bit about the Environmental Land Management Scheme, the ELM Scheme. I'm going to talk a bit about natural capital and other ways of investing in the environment. And then, yes, yeah, say something more about uh, profitable land use. So in terms of uh, ELMs, we've all heard the mantra of public money for public goods. This is something the CLA has supported for a long time. So we've um, we know we've long supported the move towards a public goods based uh, policy. We think it's sort of pragmatic, it's fair, it's good for the sector in the long term at least. Um, and on the slide here, you can see the list of public goods that the government's proposing to pay land managers to deliver. And these map across onto their 25 year environment plan. So I was going to make a few points about uh, the ELM scheme from the CLA's point of view. I think that something that's been quite interesting about the process is DEFRA have called it co-design. So the idea that they they try to involve more people into the actual design of this new policy. Um, I think, you know, formally, particularly when policy was in part, uh, the parameters were dictated by the EU. Um, often it was sort of presented fully formed to farmers to sign up to or not uh, new environmental schemes, for example, um, maybe with a few small number of people involved behind the scenes in the process. Jeffrey have tried to open that up a lot more with ELMS and they've been um, presenting their kind of thoughts and ideas and asking for feedback, which has been at times a slightly torturous process, but I think it's starting to bear some fruit. Um, the new discussion document that DEFRA published earlier this year put a bit of meat on the bones as to what direction they're heading in. But it is a very complex policy. I think when Michael Gove first presented it, he talked about a world leading policy that's never been tried before. The idea of a, a public goods policy where contracts between land managers and the governments for them to deliver environmental outcomes. It is, it is quite complicated and it covers quite a lot of different areas. So inherently there are going to be difficulties, I think, and the CLA is keen to make sure that those are minimized and that 
extensive testing is carried out to make sure that the policy is fit for purpose when it does arise. It's also, I think, important to emphasise that ELMS is not a like-for-like -like replacement for direct payments, so you're not expecting the same amount of money to go to the same people under the new scheme. It's an additional income stream, but it is um, payment for the delivery of, of public goods. So, as with other operations, so producing crops or animals, um, you are you, you will be paying some money to um, deliver environmental benefits, and we will hope that you get paid at least the costs and additionally a profit on top of that. Um, but it will it will cause some businesses to have to to think differently about what they're doing. Another thing we're considering is how you move from the ambition and principles that the government have set out for what they want ELMS to look like into when agreements are actually signed on the ground will take uh, some time. And so many of our members are asking, what can we do in the meantime? And I think that um, what we've said is that there is some understanding already out there. So we do know, um, we know the, sh the broad shape of ELMS in terms of the types of things that, the types of public good that will be needed to deliver. And looking at uh, existing schemes and evidence and science, we know roughly what uh, farmers and land managers can do to deliver things like wildlife habitat, clean water and other public goods. And we've also said that um, people should consider joining countryside stewardship. I think that came up on the Slido answers. I think um, Elms is not going to be here until 2024 at the earliest, except for the pilots. So we're saying to people that countryside stewardship, which is a far from perfect scheme, but has been improved over the years. And the fact that it's now under UK government control allows for further improvements and sort of reducing the complexity. So it offers a potentially stable income stream and the government have guaranteed that anyone who does enter a countryside stewardship scheme will be guaranteed to be able to not, uh, enter an ELM scheme if they have that opportunity later down the line. So we think that probably means allowing to break their CS contract early if they've got a better opportunity through ELMS. Um, and something else I think you can do now is uh, start to collaborate, start to, to think about your local area, your neighbours, the community, because I think that's all going to be quite important for ELMS of thinking about what you could deliver in collaboration. That seems to be uh, one of the watchwords for the new scheme. So thinking about how you might do that um, as a land manager is something you can start to do now. Um, so I think it's important to say that ELMS is not the only game in town. So while it's important, there are other pieces of the jigsaw that need to be uh, got right. We obviously have a, a trade deal that needs to be in place. We have um, improvements to countryside stewardship. But also, um, I think that it's important to think about agriculture and other land uses such as forestry and how they can be made to be profitable in their own right. I think without direct payments, the profitability of agriculture is going to be put under the spotlight. So the CLA has provided a business adaptation program, which we think should come in as soon as possible, ideally now, which should be a package of support for farmers to consider their options, look at their business. Um, it could include uh, capital investment, grants, training, skills, advice, everything we can do really to ensure that as direct payments are removed, businesses are able to adapt to the future. And that needs to be, as I say, in place um, too. And I think to make um, agriculture and food production particularly profitable, um, there may need to be some fairly radical thinking as well, and I think that the national food strategy that Henry Dimbleby is undertaking is one opportunity to think more broadly about the food system as a whole, about what it delivers, about the values it has, um, and about the whole supply chain. So one of the other areas the CLA has been uh, heavily involved in is, is sort of picking up speed at the moment. Um, is around uh, environmental investment of other types and natural capital particularly. So we see natural capital as a new way of thinking about the value of land and the assets on land and also a framework for making decisions about land management, uh, sometimes by thinking a little differently about what's on the land. Um, so I think those benefits from land management that I mentioned before, the environmental and social benefits that uh, Crewed by people, sort of not just the land managers themselves, they need to be recognised more widely. And if this happens, that could bring uh, public and private investment opportunities for people who might be prepared to pay for those for those outcomes or for those benefits. Um, so, who might make those payments? Um, I've already touched on what the government might do. 
I think that uh, it's been talked about in a previous um, webinar, but biodiversity net gain, which is something the Environment Bill introduces, is another opportunity. Uh, water companies have been doing this for some years now, but you know they know that to meet some of their objectives in terms of water quality, for example, it's often cost effective for them to pay land managers to do good land management, basically. Um, flooding is another issue. I think it's going to become more important as climate change starts to bite and businesses at risk of flooding or the, those who insure those businesses are again starting to think a bit more differently perhaps about um, how to prevent flooding, how to lower that risk, which again can sometimes be done through uh, different ways of managing land and that could be paid for in the future. Um, I mentioned uh, food production, the supply chain. I mean, we already see some examples of essentially consumers being prepared to pay a bit more for food if they think it's been produced sustainably uh, through leaf or organic schemes, for example. So I think you're starting to see some of that idea that paying for food that's been produced by people who have good stewardship of the land could uh, command a premium. Uh, carbon credits, I won't say a huge amount about, but I mean, it's a big issue, especially with the government commitment to net zero. And then a few more innovative ideas of, of again, how we use land, green prescribing. So it's increasing evidence of the health, mental health and well-being benefits of being outside, being in green space and in nature. And the health service is starting to think more seriously about this and indeed prescribing people to go outside and spend time uh, in nature. Um, which could be beneficial for those people who are managing that land. And that final box, I call it corporate investment, it could be called green finance. There's a whole sort of raft of ideas that are fairly um, at the early stages right now, but it's about how businesses and how the financial sector think about the environment. Uh, that could be about the risks uh, in their supply chain, it could be about their own environmental impact and how to minimise or offset that. Or from the financial sector, it could be about how to facilitate some of this, so how to um, facilitate carbon trading or biodiversity uh, habitat banking, for example. So just to end, I was going to cover um, what, what needs to happen next and what I think that we could do as a sector. Um, I think that the sector needs to work together. I think this um, uh, land management 2.0 uh, thing has been very interesting to see all the different voices out there but it's also important to remember that not everyone's at the same stage of thinking so the CLA represents a very broad range of land managers and while some of the most sort of entrepreneurial forward-thinking people might be looking at the opportunities I've mentioned and thinking there's something there for them there are others who may be more anxious more less clear about what they need to do and more worried about the future so we need to be careful about those who are risk, at risk of being left behind and think about how we can advise them as a membership organisation, but also how the government and other parts of the private sector can develop in a way that accounts for different types of farms, different types of land managers. I think the government does need to continue its direction of travel, but also to be mindful of the pace and the scale of change that's coming and think about carefully about that transition uh, and the sort of the risk of unforeseen consequences if it's done thoughtlessly. Um, we need to continue to promote recognition of the benefits of good land management. So that's the economic benefit. So the CLA has a campaign called the Rural Powerhouse, which is talking about the productivity gap between the rural economy and the urban economy, and that if that gap was closed, it would be a, a big benefit to the economy as a whole, but also the social and environmental benefits that I mentioned. So the more people realize that good land management produces a whole range of benefits, the more likely they are to take it seriously to invest time and energy in it. And finally, I think land managers and landowners need to think about their assets and their businesses carefully. I think that sustainability and the green agenda are definitely here to stay and everyone should be taking that seriously. And given the change that I've talked about, um, having a sort of diversity of income streams, diversity of, of contracts is going to be very important. Um, for, the, for those businesses to have resilience. So thinking a bit differently about, about land than maybe you're used to is something that I think is going to be increasingly important for businesses. And I will end there. Harry, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. And it's always fascinating to hear the CLA's perspective on what the future might look like. So incredibly useful for everyone. Thank you. And we will be making all of these slides available on our website afterwards. So please do find them on, on, on the website under Harry's profile.
Um, so now we have uh, Jeremy Moody, who is going to be presenting uh, on tomorrow's work, perspective on the future of land management. Uh, Jeremy, if you're there, do you want to share your screen and then unmute yourself? Jeremy, over to you. Many thanks indeed, and very good to be with you, Tim. Uh, this talk, I can see in many ways, complements where Harry has just been. The difference are very much, as you will see as we go through the slides, I suspect is that I'm looking at the different advice that every individual business will need. The background for the CAAV, Central Association of Agricultural Valuers, is that it's a professional association, so it's not representing interests, it's looking to ensure that professional advisors can give professional advice to each client. We've been around for 110 years as a national profession. Our work is growing and we're, more, and we're increasingly active across the whole rural economy as that becomes increasingly more diverse. And we have gone in the last decade to be UK wide, Scotland joining us in 2010, Northern Ireland in 2015. Throughout that, we're acting for and advising farmers and owners and others in the rural economy. And our role with members is to brief them, to represent them and to qualify them through examinations and those who pass the examinations become fellows at FAAV. Looking ahead and building perhaps more on what Harry was saying, we see great accelerants of change coming through at the moment. Everybody, of course, has talked about Brexit, though that has become a little uh, in, in the background just briefly, though it's coming around again, but with the virus. We have Brexit driving changes, I could suspect a generation's worth of change within the next decade. But behind that and beyond that, we have then the changes coming through from climate change and climate change policy, driving over a generation, but a lot having to be done in the next decade in order to have a platform to hit the 2050 target. And looking at each business and looking at the sector as a whole, we're looking at the question of how you manage change or be managed by it. We're moving towards markets. I'm gonna take you beyond politics to look at business. We we'll want to watch asset values, profits, as Harry was saying, prices of goods as those change, how asset values change, some assets possibly becoming simply stranded, whether because the effects of flooding from climate change or other market changes. And at the heart of this, for a large part of the rural economy, the issues of farming productivity and farming economics. So we have the external pressures, the advent of technology, the new technologies, World markets and changing public taste and our greater openness to both, environmental concern and climate change. But internally, we have productivity. The structural change coming and probably coming in some force. The need for skills for investment for innovation to adapt to a radically changing and much more open set of market conditions. How that works through with land occupation, tax and other issues, and new policies and the bases for trade. That is a very challenging and turbulent environment for us to try to master rather than for us to be on the receiving end of it. And it seems worth just keeping an eye on this and some sense of perspective as to where value really lies. People talk a lot about subsidy and point out that in terms of net profit, it can often for many ordinary conventional farming businesses amount to a very significant fraction of the margin they make. But of their gross income, product sales is vastly more important. And indeed, a relatively modest movement in product prices dwarfs very considerable movements in subsidy value. And it's that that I think we need to keep an eye on. It is the delivery of effective businesses to thrive in the future that matters. And indeed, the role of subsidy in that then varies dramatically between sectors and by farm performance. High output sectors, less exposed to subsidy, more subsidized sectors, clearly more so simply by virtue of that. We're looking, and you wanted a perspective on land management, we're looking at competing land uses. The whole pressure of the whole pressure on the crucible of rural land in a crowded island like, like Great Britain, you're looking at competing uses, the tensions that land goes for development, land is wanted for environment, land is wanted for food. Some of those uses can overlap, some of them compete directly. The list on the rest of this slide, very largely drawn from the Climate Change Committee's recommendations for land use, but where we go with carbon sequestration, soil management, compatible, very compatible with food production, trees, much less so. We have, as has just been mentioned, biodiversity net gain and the opportunities for perhaps capital and perhaps income from that 
um, but how far that will be biodiversity delivered by agricultural and food production means or in place of it remains to be seen. The challenge of greenhouse gas reduction all told through land management, livestock slurry fertilizers, again issues of air quality brought into there, restoring peatlands, bioenergy crops, and added to the climate change committee's list, the prospect of plants for plastic and other new uses for what can be produced from the land. Harry has talked about mainly about the public sector, referring of course to private interests as well, and I'm perhaps going to lead here the other way around, just so we draw out that tension or the opportunity. It's not just the state. There are very large sums of money potentially available from private finance. Our problem is finding how to marshal and manage and attract them. We will see a framework set by regulation, the rising regulatory baseline. We could see tools from taxation and the taxpayers' money there with whether it's subsidy or support or contracts there again as tools. But companies are under increasing pressure, whether it's down the supply chain or simply just needing to offset their particular goals. The Task Force on Climate Change Disclosure is, in, is, is, is producing a tighter set of demands on businesses, large businesses, to look at where they're going on climate change issues. There are powerful needs, indeed, as we've seen recently, to look at protecting supply chains and reputations secure contracts with better prices can bind the producers into those supply chains in ways that are a relatively small cost to some purchasers and processors. Harry's mentioned insurers, developers, water companies, all in the end focus on land management if we can find ways of dealing with that. But on the farm, virtually everything here is outside the farmer's reach. What the farmer controls is what's under his boot, just as has been true for centuries. Worth understanding the outside pressures, review the business, raise its performance, consider enterprise choices or other business, and we'll come on to some of those issues in a little while. The options for structural change or retirement. But coming to a question that gets quite asked quite often at this point, farming's instinct to defer decision, there can, in the world that we foresee, be no reason for deferring the management of change. We, if you start now, or indeed, as the Chinese are supposed to say, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the second best time is now. Think now, understand, weigh the options, talk, then decide, and then act. So looking at this from the point of view of professional advisors, clients facing major change, and some of it coming quite sharply as BPS comes to be phased out, and as we move possibly towards more open international markets. What will clients want from advisors? And that's where we have, over the last couple of years, in the CAV, set in hand a future skills program, looking at what will support our members, support their clients as we move into that world. At the front of that, and work already developed on business review skills. How do you look at a business? How do you talk them through it? What are the options? Different answers for different families on different farms, even identical farms but with different families will have different answers and we published reviewing a business in December as a text on this and a carrying forward work on that front to support members. Environmental resources, innovation and technology, new business activities and effective and appropriate dispute resolution are all part of that matrix of trying to help support businesses through all of this. There is our publication on reviewing a business I said published in December and going through trying to help people go through and understand the issues in play from the accounts right the way through to how you hold the conversation. We hit though this basic issue of farm economics and productivity. We have on all the official data a relatively poor productivity record. In brutal terms British agriculture has generally tracked the exchange rate more than more than seen a pattern of improvement. And the figures can be hammered home, but it comes back to skills, investment, innovation. It comes back to getting the right people on the land to do the right things on that land. It also has to be said that those are averages. and We will see that higher performance farms do distinctively better. The range, as almost any advisor knows, is enormous. But we're dealing with a sector that X subsidy is making little money at the average at the aggregate 
that simply takes estimates from later last year for 2019, effectively less than a billion of margin once you discount the subsidy. It is worth pointing out, of course, that the subsidy will have flowed heavily into cost along the way, but you're still talking about relatively low return on that turnover. And you see that the historically supported sectors are the ones that in the middle years of the last decade tended to be the ones that lost money. But there, just taking farm business survey figures for combinable cropping, there is the difference in performance between the average, the top quartile and the bottom quartile from farming. This is before subsidy, this is before agro-environment, this is before other on-farm income. This is the distribution of the money that was made or lost from the activity and the decision of farming. And the top quartile made 200 odd pound a hectare. The bottom quartile lost over 300 pound a hectare. That difference will show in every part of the UK and in every sector. And challenging that is a fundamental thing that will come as the cushion of BPS is withdrawn. We need to look to how to adapt this. This is where Brexit accelerates change. We have had area payments of one form or another for a generation since McSharry in 93. How we adapt to that change with new structures, using the new technologies, changing in who is farming, looking much more effectively at marketing, home and abroad, and a little question I'll pose later about scale. But it comes back to margin, not cash flow, not gross cash flow necessarily, but margin. Where does profit lie, the return on our endeavours? BPS, very high margin. If you remove BPS and even allowing, as Harry hoped, for the possibility of some profit on Elms, is that a billion of lost margin over the seven year transition period to be clawed back from costs by changing structures? And much of that can be done over a time scale like seven years. And that's the time in which decisions need to be made for people even to stand still, never minding the kind of progress that we would like to see. And it drives you to those thoughts about who is farming, who comes in, who goes out, generational succession, one or two generations, is the generational succession outside the family, the facilitating issues in that, the advice, the house, housing issues, and so on. And the key changes in the how of farming that the right people will then be able to use in production, farm structures, the technologies, marketing, land use. And it's managing those changes well, rather as Harry concluded, is critical, at the level of each individual business as it seeks to find and to hold commercial margin. So again, review and act, said already the standard things here, but the theme I return to again is managing change before it manages you. Adding value. The rest of UK manufacturing moved into speciality and high value produce when it went through the mill in the 1980s. How far is it right that British farmers remain commodity growers? Many can be, but can all and should all. Those are decisions for each to face. What will earn a margin? Adding value. People can look at special things to do. A challenge in that quite frequently though is scaling up to a, margin, to a, to a scale that delivers significant turnover and profit. It's an interesting observation that perhaps now a third of British farm output by value comes from being undercover, whether it's horticulture under plastic, right through to where we're now experimenting with controlled environment farming. Adding value to capital or to income through data, soils, carbon, water biodiversity, other activity. And you can see the post COVID economy possibly offering attractions in the rural economy for industry and business services to relocate. And an underlying challenge here is whether farming is and remains the principal form of land management. Head on, the environment is an enterprise. See it as an enterprise, alongside your lamb, alongside your wheat, alongside your milk. The question is, and Harry referred to the phrase, you've seen public money being offered for public goods. For that to be a transaction, the question is, why should you sell public goods? Where is the margin? Where does it fit? Is it in synergy with your productive farming? Soil management classically? Can it go alongside it? Is it a substitute for less profitable farming? Where does it work together? 
what opportunity costs do you incur through going for woodland or whatever? But looking at the marketplace, not only including the state, but those other private sector interests and how we put that together. So scale for income, I've already mused about that on the question of speciality. How do you build scale for income? A commodity business will want land, but commodity businesses are now getting much more choosy about the land they want to take. They want opportunities that will give a margin and help support overheads, ultimately profit. But if you're not a commodity business, the scale of your business may no longer be measured in acres. Either way, you may be looking for land that suits you or looking to release land that no longer does. That land may well be an opportunity though for somebody else to come in and be part of that process of change, of accelerated change that we foresee. There's also the point that te new technology may alter the case for scale. Much of this has been driven by, the, by new larger machinery in order to fund the man. Once you have unmanned machinery, those, those dynamics of, of cost begin to change and scale in public goods. Some of those private sector capital interests will need to see people come together as large groups to provide packages that are efficient transactions for private finance, while biodiversity itself gains more value with scale. So again, tackling some of those. And so I come back as a professional association, advising tenants, advising owners, advising all with an interest in these matters. The external view. Farmers can make themselves very busy as a means of avoiding looking at these things and then things get out of perspective. The external view to get things in perspective, looking at other farms and the broader experience and the value to a family farm of a safe challenger, somebody who can put the questions to them that they might have resent from somewhere else and that turns on the quality of the relationship. There's social support and knowledge exchange in this, sometimes with other farmers, but also from the advisor. But the two sorts of professional advice, there is specialist help. You want a planning permission. You want a nutrient management plan. That's specific. But what CAV members can bring is the rounded appraisal, the strategic advice. How does tax fit with planning, with the tenancy agreement, with the bank finance constraints, and understanding what the family want as well? Where do they want to be in 10 years time and how are we going to get there? And so facilitating the conversation with the family and others or indeed between landlord and tenant or other interested parties. And there's this nice phrase from the Welsh government's consultation paper of last year. Advice should be seen as investment in the capacity of farmers and farms rather than the cost. Of course, it then has to be good advice. And I would summarize that as quality and chemistry, the right advice from the right person for that family. So we have large issues. We have those great large issues of international trade, of changing public policy in each part of the United Kingdom as we go ahead over the, over the coming decade. But they have to be answered on individual farms by each landowner and each farmer finding their answer in their family circumstances with their resources and their weaknesses, their assets and their strengths. And there are no absolute answers in a market economy in a liberal society. People are free to hunker down and take the pain, but we would rather they took the positive opportunities. We will almost certainly see a much less standardized rural economy than we've been used to. More people doing more interesting things in search of more profit. So the personal preferences are part of that and new skills and new opportunities. And we're looking then at encouraging people to take the better answers. But that requires on help in negotiating the obstacles. And I come back to that theme that I've now already stressed a couple of times. But the theme that we have to take in looking at the future is that of how we manage change rather than being on the receiving end of it, leaving it to manage us. Great. Jeremy, thank you so much. An incredibly detailed overview, uh, as we were expecting. Um, I'm now going to share my screen and we're going to go into the next section and both Harry and uh, Jeremy have a question for everybody. Uh, so hopefully you can see my screen. Um, Harry's question first. So I'm just going to paste this through the chat function to you all. Again, just hit the escape key or 
uh, jump into the chat function and click the link and that should open up in your browser. Um, so Harry's question is, what are the main benefits of membership bodies to help the land management sector prepare for the future? So um, for those who can't get the link from the chat function, do just get your mobile phone out, turn on your camera, hover it over the QR code up here in the top left, and you should be able to answer this question on your phone. So Harry's question, so what are the main benefits of membership bodies to help the land management sector prepare for the future? Advice, education, unity, trust, knowledge, support, uh, political weight, lobbying, wider perspective information, reassurance, training, uh, what else have we got? Team working, standardization, but otherwise advice, knowledge, education, support, trust, very much picking up on Jeremy's point just earlier. Um, fantastic signposting, another hugely important thing as we go forward, advice, knowledge, support. And just remember those who are answering, uh, who've managed to get into the Slido answer, please do remember you can answer as many times as you want because it's really great just to kind of see what the thoughts are, and so feel free to share as much as you wish. Um, so advice, knowledge, lobbying, fantastic, education, and trust. Fantastic, thank you. Well, that's that one. What we'll do now is we'll jump into uh, Jeremy's questions. So let me just uh, grab that, play, paste that through to everybody, and jump into present mode. So, um, so Jeremy's question is, what are the keys to encourage more landowners and farmers to take positive changes rather than taking the pain. So what are the, the keys to encouraging more landowners and farmers to take positive choices? So everything that Jeremy was just referring to, to take positive choices rather than taking the pain. Money, knowledge, education, information, margins. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, so money, education, knowledge, funding, confidence, support, examples, clarity. So what are the keys to encouraging more landowners and farmers to take positive choices rather than taking the pain? Money, education, confidence, support, good advice, good examples. Fantastic. Understanding, oh, brilliant, working with nature, brilliant. Fantastic. Well, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so the last thing, just to finish off, is slightly different to what we usually do, and as Matthew alluded to at the beginning, um, we have, since we've had so much call cool for people to get better networked, to understand more, to learn, to share, um, we have set up a Slack channel for the rural land management sector. So we already have nearly 300 people who have joined the channel. Uh, just quickly as how this works, essentially there's a thread that everyone can contribute to. It's the one big thread where everyone can chat. Uh, you can message people directly. So you can find people who have a similar interest and message them directly, jump on a call all together. Um, and you can jump into specific groups and teams. So we've got one on regenerative agriculture. So there's a rich conversation already happening there. We've got one on trees. I can see there's a new post in water um, and also regional as well. So let's have a look. Southwest, a big conversation with people involved in the Southwest. So um, please do jump in and join. I'll share the link now, but we would love you to be part of the conversation um, as we continue to work forward uh, to the future. So I will stop sharing and I will hand you over to Matthew for the Q&A se section. Thanks, Tim. Uh, well, um... Some good questions have come in. I'm going to start with uh, Harry, if I may. Uh, Harry, if you want to turn on your video and audio, that'd be great. Um, Harry, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about the sort of scale of change that's anticipated, uh, bringing large risks. Um, but do those large risks not bring the prospect of large rewards? And, and you know, in terms of radical thinking, is there enough radical thinking in the land management sector or do we need more? That's an interesting question. I think, I mean, I think there is quite a wide spectrum and we see that in our own membership. I mean, there are people, people have different appetites for risk. And so I think there are certain uh, farmers, certain land managers who see this, this change, this sort of shaking up of, of the system as 
an opportunity and part of that opportunity I suppose is that if you if you have the appetite for risk and you make a decision early on, maybe change your investment, you know, do something different on your land, there is the potential for great rewards. That's not universally held. I think I made the point in my presentation that for all the people sort of out in front with that mindset, there are plenty of others who either aren't aware of some of the changes that are coming. I think it's hard to underestimate that for lots of farmers they're not entirely clear what ELMS is, maybe not 100% sure of when or how much BPS is going to be cut. So that idea of taking advantage of the risk was not necessarily part of their thinking yet. Um, and I think that, you know, there is a, a danger in, in trying to sort of rip everything up and start again and think that that's going to bring a good outcome. I think something that's probably underappreciated is the, the social impact of what some of these changes could mean, apart from the sort of economic and environment, which is perhaps talked about quite a lot, but, you know, in terms of rural communities, what it could mean. So I think that for that reason alone, there's a, there's a reason to, to sort of proceed slowly and carefully. Um, there's not necessarily a reason not to have change. And we do have several years to transition to, to the new, the new normal, but during that time, and I think, you know, Jeremy brought it out quite well in his presentation, the need for advice for each individual to think carefully about what the future holds and whether that's kind of charging ahead with a strong appetite for the, the new sunlit uplands or being much more cautious and thinking much more carefully. I think everyone might have to change, but there might be different ways that people proceed down that road. Yeah. And just thinking about our current situation with COVID-19, um, do you feel, what's the CLA sort of take on that? Do you think that that pushes the sort of the green ecosystem revolution down the road? Are we, are we going to see, um, are we going to see a sort of delay in terms of uh, decision making and uptake because of you know, the impact that this has had on the economy? Do you, do you see that, that that's going to push things down the road? Um, is it a cop out to say it's too early to tell? I think that, you know, there's there's a sort of tension, isn't there, that the hit to the economy, which I suppose we're still in the midst of knowing exactly what what that's going to look like, may change what the government is willing to do, um, although they seem pretty set on continuing down the path that they had set out. Um, I think that there is a lot of talk about a green recovery, and I think that... Um, if you can, if you think that uh, big change is a chance for people to sort of think very differently about their options, then this, as Brexit before it, it provides that sort of space and opportunity to think to think differently, perhaps about the whole economy, and that will include the land management sector. Um, but yeah, I think I don't think it's it's clear to me yet exactly what's going to happen. It is, it is too soon. I think that there, will, there may well be pressure on public spending, but then. Uh, as we sort of discussed, there's also, it's not just about what the government does, it's not just about uh, public subsidy, you know, the wider picture of climate change and, and green and environmental concerns may be, may be there. And I think the focus on the food system that we've seen as part of um, the virus and the response to that is again a chance to sort of to rethink from first principles perhaps what we want from our, from our land and from our food system. And, and just thinking about the sort of collaborative side of things and the importance of that, really, um, from a CLA sort of members perspective, are you, are you doing anything to sort of encourage your members to work together to deliver sort of natural capital enhancements on a on landscape scale, uh, encouraging members to join farmer clusters, that sort of thing? Is, is that something that CLA are encouraging? It is something we're encouraging, and I think there's, a, there's probably more we can do to, to move further in that direction. I think that we certainly think that collaboration is going to come become more and more important. Um, I think there's some interesting developments around, um, I suppose, particularly in Elms, about how local priorities, local decisions are going to be made. Um, there's talk about the sort of nature recovery network, which seems to be have, well, we have quite a local uh, element to it. So I certainly think we're encouraging members to, to sort of look beyond the farm gate when they're thinking about what the future might hold for them. And we've been a supporter of, of cluster farms. We think that they are a good model and should be should be supported. And we also think that there should be sort of incentivization from the government incentives to to collaborate. So I think that it's definitely something that we're we're encouraging members to do, and we'd like to see a lot more of. Brilliant. Thanks, Harry. I'll come back to you for a joint question, if I may, in a little while. Uh, Jeremy, if I could, uh, if I could turn to you now. Um, if you want to switch your audio and uh, video on, that would be great. 
I'm told you've stopped it. Ah. Tim will do the magic. <laughs> well, we can hear you, Jeremy. Now you right? should be able to, Jeremy. You should be able to turn on the video now. Fantastic. There we are. Hi, Jeremy. Um, so, um, as you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a member of the CAV. It's a, you know, it's a small, small organisation. Um, just the, your, your comment about there's going to be more people doing more interesting things. As, as a member organisation, you, you talked about the sort of future skills programme and sort of forward-facing nature of, of that advice. Um, how do you do it? How do you, how do you, how do you keep your, your membership updated with the latest facts, figures, stats that they need? To go out there in the field how 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 do you where do you start well the, the easy tool now that modern technology gives you is the website and we do a heavy briefing on the website of things that are current and that carries some or not not just immediate information but also a certain amount of analysis more sustained analysis comes through in publications and obviously presentations at conferences and now of course in as the last few months moving more remotely uh, through webinars like this and and also this year podcasts as means to try to get uh, not only what is current as, as if you like fact but also understanding and analysis so that people can see how these things fit together and do you feel that that uh, i mean obviously this we, we've all we've all leapt into these new ways of working um do you feel that in terms of the cavs uh, work with uh, government agencies and that sort of thing you're always on the sort of front foot in terms of um, working closely with DEFRA and seeing where policy was emerging and evolving. Do you see that has become uh, sort of more or less uh, easy uh, as a result of uh, these new ways of working or do you see this as a bonus so you can have better access? I think it's terribly, it is as rather Harry saying, it's terribly early to know because at the moment for, for the first six or seven weeks it was really just adapting to the new situation. Now we're trying to understand where the new situation is going uh, I think people have adapted much more readily than they thought that they ever thought they would to remote working. There is in that though a tension between remote working and networking. Uh, the, the, the loss of physical contact. Um, when you talk to somebody who now says I've got a new client and I never, never met them. That is quite a challenge, I think, I, th I, th I think in our world. And where we, whereas we come through the autumn and through the winter and see how this goes, where people find the new balance remains to be seen. I, I think there are questions about where this has accelerated business activity, business change that was happening anyway, and you can suggest it's, changed, it's accelerated matters perhaps by five years, that will stick. Where we're just doing awkward work rounds, because this is the hole we're in, then we'll probably go back to doing what we we're doing before, in the sense that tomorrow is always quite like yesterday. Uh, the balance in that early to call. I, I made allusions in passing in my remarks around the prospects for rural property that people who no longer want or can for the next few months go into city centers and go into buildings with 43 stories and a lift may very well prefer to be with a few colleagues in in in, in an office on a farm near a market town have yeah. the, the secure it the office resource be away from the cat and the five-year-old and and, and 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 yet have the benefits in office yeah Jeremy, your graph that you popped up um, showing the uh, kind of disparity between the, the kind of top performers uh, and, and those that, that aren't performing so well, should we say, uh, I think garnered quite a lot of debate in the, in the questions. And um, do, you, do you see the, the sort of green pounds sort of backfilling the, the loss that, 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 was, that was existing there, that, that disparity? But also, um, what about the environmental harm that the top quartile uh, of, of possibly caused in, in, in achieving those figures. Do you see the, do you see everything sort of doing this? Not, not so much. I mean, on the whole, the evidence is that the people who are better at running more productive businesses are often very much better at being good at other things as well. And indeed are probably more alert to the wide, wider environment they're in. Uh, you know, with, with all these generalizations, they're clearly massive exceptions and we can produce counter examples and the like. But on the whole, that seems to be the, the way that analysis shows things to, to, to fall out, the better people who do things in a more timely way are, are more efficient in their use of resources, uh, are not necessarily those who are um, destroying the land at the same time. They often have other the concerns that support other things, uh, and they're better at doing the other things as well. 
no universal rule, but that would that seems to be the general principle. I'm quite wary of expecting public support for public goods to come in time to rep to replace uh, the pressures on business finance. Uh, there will be some people for whom it will that that will work. I don't think we should allow the assumption that this enables you to avoid looking hard at your business. Uh, and that's the risk. I think that the, the talk of these schemes as being a substitute for BPS is, I think, an unfortunate delusion at this point. They are a new way of looking at things. But the point I did try to make on one of the slides was that there is, you know, BPS is uh, taken in one year is virtually all profit. It is unlikely that at the average for most people, the new schemes will offer that kind of profit margin. And of course, not all BPS is going to ELM. Some of it will go into productivity schemes. Some of it will go into other, other goals of public policy in this area. So slight, so less money goes in offering less profit. Uh, the business has to be got right in the first place and the business is what people can, can control. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, yeah. It's a very good point, Jeremy. And, and you, you talked about, you know, that process of managing change and, and those, frankly, difficult conversations that, that are ahead, you know, um, whether it's, mm. uh, I think you talked about the, um, you know, the, 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 the who and the how, um, you know, who, who, who's farming and how they're farming, uh, mm. how they're managing land. Um, I mean, just in terms of equipping your members uh, with the skills to have those difficult conversations, I mean, do, do you think there's more training needed in, in, in managing that process? Because those conversations can be quite tricky, can't they? They can be quite tricky. Often they're easier once you've broached them. Very often there is an instinctive desire not to hold those conversations and it's all too difficult. Occasionally they are just as difficult as you fear they're going to be. Uh, but quite often it's interesting you can see a sense of relief as something that everybody knew they ought to talk about is at last being talked about. As I said, we've started with publications, we're looking at holding now, um, we were going to hold a, hold a conference on this and workshops back in March. Uh, the virus got in the way of that, but we're now looking to do those that, that exercise remotely uh, in a couple of months time, well, actually now next month. Uh, and that work will continue uh, uh, as we go on. Some of it is essentially the technical matter of giving people greater confidence in how they would want to read accounts or look at the physical performance of businesses. But more of it, as you say, is that soft skill exercise, the facilitation, it's judging how you deal with a family. You know, the interesting point, do you start with the families at the table with, with the youngest first? Mm. And so slowly working around till you get to the person who thinks they still hold the checkbook. Uh, and those sorts of area. Um, but, but it is interesting. There are often easier conversations to have than you think, but there will be people. And within families, there will be some people who, for whom everything that we've gone through this, this, this afternoon will be taking them across broken glass. Yes. Uh, because for some of them, this is existential. For yeah. some of them, they'll be in situations where the real answer is to have somebody else farm their land, farm it better, produce them more money in rent than it will give them they could ever have hoped to have earned from it. And to see value and virtue in that as an outcome may take, uh, Conversation over time. A big, a big sticking plaster, perhaps. Tear it off and uh, go for it. Uh, it. Harry, if I could bring you back in. Um, there's a, a joint question coming from uh, Patricia, uh, which shot to the top of the uh, the, the popularity states, and um, it, it, it's, it says that some might say that the recent rejection of the food standards amendments, the agriculture bill, has shown that government uh, cannot necessarily be trusted when it comes to that sort of balance between public benefit, domestic food production, financial or political advantage. Um, so the question to both of you is really, what, what, what do you feel? Do you, do you agree that rural businesses need to prioritise their public engagement uh, to really protect themselves from these cheap imports? Do they need to sort of get their message out now, be on the front foot? And how, 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 how best they might, might, might they do that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think definitely. I think you know we have seen with the agriculture bill in Parliament that the, the government may not be offering as much support as those 
farmers might like in terms of uh, our trading relationship. Uh, and I think it is, you know, th there are various uh, options people can take, but I think that kind of public communication about essentially making the case for why people should be supporting British farmers if, if the government through their trade agreements aren't going to, and the CLA still very much hopes that that will be the case. But if not, then, um, you know, I think there is a case for the British people to, to support uh, British production if it's done in a sustainable way, if it's done in a way that manages the landscape which people want to see. Uh, so I think that there are various reasons why why you do, why we would expect that. But yeah, you definitely you can't necessarily sort of relax and expect it to happen. You need to to make that case, and there's probably a role for the land management sector, but also other parts of the supply chain and and the, uh, to to make that case. And it's certainly something the CLA is is keen to do. And Jeremy, your your thoughts in terms of uh, how we how we tackle that particular problem? Well, the first thought is that ultimately we have to look to ourselves for our own salvation that looking for looking to government as the ultimate answer in this is mistaken and it's something that probably over the years agriculture because of its close entanglement with government whether before we went into the eu or while within the cap has been more prone to doing than most other sectors of the economy and so I think the first thing is that we have to look to ourselves and I say what the farmer controls is within his ring fence under his boot. It's sorting the business out. It, it, it's looking at how you deliver the income that the family want from it. Uh, secondly, much, much more immediately, but, but not at all to detract from that point. I think you are watching at the moment a genuine debate going on inside the heart of government. Which way does it want to jump in the next few months? So this isn't a longer term, necessarily a longer term question, it's which way it jumps on, on the issue of the parish, if you like, sum it up in the parish amendment, which that is simply a surface symptom of this larger debate going on. Um, and is that effectively the played out so that DEFRA and, 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 and agriculture come out with, with the recognition of standards and so on as is being debated, or is it openness to international trade uh, as perhaps if you want it to be, 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 be crude in your analysis, that would be the DIT position, the Department of International Trade position in this one. And that's unresolved. So at that point, that kind of work that the CLA and other organisations are doing, uh, the kind of work that people can do with their MPs and, and, and locally in the very short term ha ha has a function. Medium term, of course, yes, it, it, in serving your market, you are selling yourself to your public who will voluntarily then pay you money for whether it's food or environment or whatever else, leisure facilities, whatever else it is you're providing, just like the good baker producing good bread, the public will come to you and you run your business to make a profit out of it. And you follow the price signals. As I said, you treat the, treat the environment like another business in this one, if it comes to that. And if you follow the profit signals and where the asset values lie, then there is your reward for the net, for business to hand on to your successors. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeremy. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Harry. And thank you, Jeremy, uh, for joining us today. It's been uh, fascinating. Um, thank you, everyone else, for, for watching us. Uh, we, we do put a recording of our uh, sessions up on our website, so uh, please do uh, check those out. Uh, look out for our roundtable sessions as well that we're uh, involved in. Uh, next week's seminar is on uh, is actually talking about government support for the land management sector, and we we've got Catherine Boyd from Defra, and Bob Middleton, who's the lead from Natural England's catchment sensitive farming team. So we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next week. Uh, continue to share this to your wider networks, and uh, thank you again to Jeremy and to Harry for your time today. And uh, it's a goodbye from Tim and I. So thank you. <laughs>